It was a most unusual story, so difficult to believe that the U.S. Air Force felt obligated to turn the event into a training video to document, quote, aviation history. Marked official use only, and to be shown only to authorized personnel, Flight Without a Fin showed a jet-powered bomber flying with its tail and vertical stabilizer sheared clean off. The video captured extensive real-life footage of the aircraft in flight, and the Directorate of Aerospace Safety hoped that it would, quote, enhance pilot understanding of B-52 flight characteristics and heighten appreciation of its capabilities. On January 10, 1964, a B-52H bomber left the Boeing Company's headquarters in Wichita, Kansas, equipped with various sensors and measuring devices attached to its nose, wings, and tail. The crew was made up of three Boeing pilots, led by instructor pilot Chuck Fisher and a navigator. Their mission appeared straightforward. They would fly an hour southwest at a low-level altitude of 500 feet, at speeds varying between 280 and 400 knots, in the direction of the Rocky Mountains. They would then turn north to fly parallel with the mountains, whose geography can cause surrounding air currents to be violent and unpredictable. Their main objective was to test the effects of air stress on the massive B-52H's equipment and components when flying in close proximity to large mountain ranges. Ultimately, the U.S. Air Force intended to use the large bombers as a major component of their last line of defense, should Cold War tensions with the Soviet Union have boiled over into an armed conflict. As much of Russia's geography is mountainous, it would have been vital for the bombers of that era to be appropriately designed and equipped to handle such terrain to be able to reach various targets across the USSR. What the crew leaving from Wichita did not account for was the strength and severity of the turbulence they would come up against that day, nor the unusual circumstances that would be required to survive what was supposed to be a routine test flight. The B-52 began its long and storied career as a prototype developed by Boeing for the U.S. Army Air Forces in the late 1940s. Back then, it was known as the XB-52, and featured propellers and straight wings. It took a radical shift in design in 1948, when the engineers were given orders from Air Force brass to lose the propellers altogether. Over a frantic weekend in a Dayton, Ohio hotel room, the Boeing engineers added two jet engines to the existing six, and to tilt the wings back 35 degrees into what are known as swept wings. They built a 14-inch scale model out of balsa wood and redubbed the plane the B-52, also known as the Strato Fortress. The Air Force welcomed the changes and accepted Boeing's proposal, and the bomber of the future was conceived. The B-52A made its inaugural flight on August 5, 1954. The plane measured an impressive 156 feet in length with a wingspan of 185 feet. The plane's tail alone weighed in at over one ton, and at 48 feet high was nearly four stories tall. Its massive size caused concerns among some of the engineers on the team that it would not be able to stand up to strong turbulence. But the Air Force pushed back, insisting that if they added weight to the tail, that meant less available weight for the storage of bombs and ammunition. As anti-communist tensions in Southeast Asia increased in the wake of the Korean War, demand from the U.S. Armed Forces for more B-52s increased. In total, 744 B-52s were built by Boeing in the decade between 1952 and 1962, when their production was shut down. Over that time, several advancements in the original A model were made, culminating in the B-52H, which added a turbofan to its engines and debuted in 1961. It was this model that the Boeing crew leaving from Wichita in January 1964 intended to monitor, and it was what happened to them in the skies over Colorado that led Boeing to make what would end up being the final improvements to the B-52 aircraft. As anticipated, the B-52H hit unsteady air over northern New Mexico as it approached the mountains, signaling the end of the trip's sixth leg. Lead pilot Chuck Fisher made the turn to fly alongside the mountains, noting that the plane's tail was experiencing heavy wind pressure. As they continued north and the turbulence increased, the decision was made among the crew to cut short the low-level portion of the flight, and Fisher raised the plane's elevation to 14,300 feet above sea level, where the air appeared to be smoother. They brought the plane's speed up to 350 knots and continued as planned, but began experiencing trouble again as the tall peaks to the west of them increased in size. As they passed by southern Colorado's East Spanish Peak, the B-52 was hit with an unexpectedly harsh blast of wind on one side of the plane, and then another rapid blast from the other. As the blows continued from all directions, the plane began to rock violently, pitching left and right. 
James Pittman, the navigator, recalls he was, quote, literally picked up and thrown against the left side of the airplane and over the navigator's table. The pilots, attempting to regain control of the plane, felt a high-frequency vibration run through the rudder pedals and controls and found both unresponsive. They had not realized it yet, but the vast majority of the plane's tail fin and rudder had been torn off in the turbulence. Only a small ridge of splintered wood remained at the rear of the plane, as if something monstrous had taken a bite out of it. Inside the cockpit, the quick decision was made to abandon the aircraft. Fisher was able to slow the plane and lower its altitude to 5,000 feet, and the crew prepared to bail out. At the last minute, however, it was determined that Fisher had regained enough control over the navigation equipment to remain aboard and attempt to salvage the mission. The pilots informed the crew back in Wichita of their situation over radio and asked for assistance. An emergency response team was hastily assembled. An F-100 Super Sabre jet stationed at Wichita and used as a chaser aircraft took off in pursuit of the B-52. Meanwhile, Fisher and the other pilots were advised to lower the B-52's landing gear in an effort to stabilize the plane's rear by adding drag. They also began to transfer fuel into reserve tanks in the front half of the plane to create a forward center of gravity. He then set the engine for landing protocol and started to bring the speed of the plane down by applying only the smallest amounts of pressure to the braking system. The F-100 Super Sabre arrived on the scene and assessed the external damage to the plane, confirming what those inside already suspected. The plane's tail had been struck cleanly off. The plan initially was to attempt to fly directly back to Wichita and land there, but inclement bad weather forced the pilots to redirect their course to Blythefield Air Force Base in nearby Arkansas. Winds there seemed to be calmer, which would help to facilitate a steady landing, and the area around the base was also sparsely populated should the attempt end in a crash. The plane's speed was brought down to 160 knots as it approached the base. The front landing gear was deployed, causing the aircraft to yaw briefly, but eventually it steadied. As the wheels touched down on the landing strip, the plane started to veer left and the emergency drag chute was deployed, bringing the vehicle to a full stop. Once on the ground, the crew emerged unscathed. They had been in the air for six hours, five of them without a tail. The measurements taken during their flight indicated that they had been hit with side winds of a strength and speed previously unrecorded by any large aircraft. Fisher praised his crew and the endurance of the aircraft itself, calling the B-52, quote, the finest airplane he ever flew. In retrospect, the problems with the B-52 tail were well known to the U.S. Air Force and the manufacturers at Boeing prior to Fisher and his crew's experience. It would only be three days later, on January 13, 1964, that a similar chain of events would bring down a B-52D over Savage Mountain in Maryland. This time, though, the stakes would be far higher, as the aircraft was carrying two live 9-megaton B-53 thermonuclear bombs. Fortunately, both weapons were found, quote, relatively intact in the approximate center of the wreckage area. In fact, between 1961 and 1963, at least three B-52s performing test flights over various parts of the U.S. lost their tails in severe turbulence. All three incidents resulted in crashes, and 14 lives were lost. Quote, It's pretty sobering to look back and see how many planes they were losing, remarked one former B-52 pilot. All in an effort driven by Cold War paranoia, to make sure that the planes would perform correctly in a hypothetical doomsday event when they would be called into action. The crashes led to an Air Force investigation in 1963, which found that in all three incidents, the bolts which connected the tail to the B-52's fuselage had been ripped out from the stress of the turbulence. It was as a result of this investigation that Fisher and his crew were sent out that day into heavy turbulence, and thus we can assume that many of those involved back on the ground in Wichita ultimately expected the result that occurred. To higher-ups, it seems that the risks were outweighed by the need to maintain a Cold War-ready, 24-hour flying nuclear deterrent. Officially, the Pentagon maintains a list of 32 Broken Arrow incidents in which lost nuclear weapons threatened the public, including a number of later B-52 accidents. Yet a secret 1970 study revealed at least 1,200 nuclear weapon mishaps that may have never been reported to the public. The Atomic Energy Act of 1946 ensures that any information related to nuclear weapons is, quote, born secret. It is entirely possible, then, that some events with outcomes less heroic than the January 10, 1964 incident may remain in the dark. <laughs>